gentlemen. Welcome to the Canastota Public Library. My name is Liz Metzger and I'm the library director. And I believe that Matt al already asked you to silence your phones, so thank you very much for doing that this evening. Um, we're very happy to have a very nice crowd for this very special event. So I'm going to let our Madison County historian, Matt Ertz, introduce our special guest. Matt Ertz, take it away. I don't think there's any way to properly introduce you, Doug. Well, I'm oh. the real guinea of Canastota. I'm the real guinea of Canastota. <laughs> what are you, you going to do? I'm the only one left. <laughs> Most so, of them all know me. Most of them. Most of them. There's a few that might not. Yeah. Doug Guinea. Thank you. I'm in the VFW Madison County War Veterans Association. Doug, where were you born? Right across the street. <laughs> the old hospital. <laughs> Right here in town. So you feel comfortable here? Oh yeah, right at home. All right. Graduated from? Right over here, uh, high school, when it was the, uh, I went to the old high school, but I graduated a new one, bent down, uh, not Peterborough, the other, Robert Street. Okay. 67. And when you graduated, went to work, signed up for the military, what did you do? Well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, I, I worked with my father and his friends for a long time. When I was 14, 13, 14 years old, I spent many a times, my father had a, a, a sideline paint business, painting barns and silos. And I spent a large time up Gates Dairy Farms. I was a small, skinny guy. They put me up on a ladder putty in the windows and I worked with him many, many in nights and weekends and until I was 18. I also had a history of working with a well-known man construction person, uh, George Carr, CCO Equipment. My father was best friends with him and we did a lot of painting there. So I had uh, two things going on and uh, my mind I was on both them functions. Uh, I didn't have no expectations of going to school farther than when I graduated here. Okay. Um, were you drafted or did you enlist? No, I was drafted. You were drafted. Do you remember when you were drafted? Yeah, 1968. And your immediate reaction was? Let's put it this way, I knew it was coming. Okay. Because I didn't sign up to go further schooling or anything else. And, Back then, back then there was an era that Kent State was going on, and everyone knows the era of Vietnam was in full strength. And a bunch of us from Canastota knew we were going. And my father and mother were concerned, of course. Your father uh, had experience with this. He yeah, was my, he, my father has a lot more experience than I do. He was a three World and a half years of World War II. Yeah, he he has me beat. Um, he was concerned, he was nervous, my mother was scared, but back then, the reason why I say Vietnam was in thing back then, everybody was talking about it. And, uh, when I was younger, five or six years old, that's all it was mentioned was the war. We played war games when Admiral G was my neighbor. And we played a lot of war games back then and it was in the air, all that from World War II. And back then, Korea was going on in 53, but we were young, we didn't really understand Korea yet. It, it, World War II was the topic. So, my father told me a lot about World War II, and uh, Ed Gambus Johnny, Butch's father, we, we learned a lot. But that was it back then. It, you know, so we topical. were we were in tune, and I know when Vietnam was on, and I didn't go any farther than what he did. I knew where I was going. There's no doubt about it. Where did you go? Where did you do your basic? I did my basic Fort Dix, New Jersey. Okay. Yeah. What was that like? An experience. <laughs> <laughs> An experience. Hey, we left. If I can remember all this, you're getting me. Uh, I, we left. Jefferson Street up in Syracuse, two or three buses, and they hustled us right down there in the middle of the night. 
none of us knew what the hell was coming off. I mean, they lined us up and they gave me a GI haircut instead of my chemo haircut right now. And uh, went through all the, the clothes and the whole works and this and that. And uh, I was in the old third down there. It was the old army barracks for World War II. They put us in there. And uh, we had to go out and do PT every day. Went to the firing ranges, that was fun. We did all the calisthenics, this and that. And as you would in Fort Dix or as you would in basic anywhere. Same old thing, a lot of that stuff you see on your movies. And uh, the biggest thrill of that when I ended that was going through the infiltration course. That was an experience. But, uh, How long were you there? Made it. I was there at Fort Dix four months, I believe. Did you get any specialized training while you were there? No. No, basically it was just basic training. Okay. What happened to me, or what happened to I, uh, we had to do certain tests, academic tests, and uh, I was asked what I wanted to be in the Army if I stayed in the Army. Well, he says, well, I, I worked in heavy equipment before I, I got here. I was around heavy equipment a lot. So I didn't know what to come of it, but when I got my orders to leave Fort Dix, myself and another gentleman were assigned to Fort Knox, Kentucky. And I said, what the hell is going on here? Well, that's where we give APC and tank training and recon training. And I looked at him, I said, well, that's, I said heavy equipment, but I didn't realize I was going to go nowhere with that. Everyone else went to infantry down Fort Polk and stuff. I and another guy was assigned to Fort uh, Knox. And yes, I did bivouac right in front of the the building with all the gold you see on TV. It was a big course out there. And we went down there for APC training and tank training. And I got right into it. Uh, we still did the push-ups, the calisthenics, like in basic, it's the same. Basically, but it was a little more to it. And um, from there, I was asked, I don't know how I did it, but I never really bowed out of nothing. I've always been courageous and I'm not bragging. But anyways, I was asked by Sergeant Dalbert, would you like to go to Shake and Bake School? What is Shake and Bake School? And I looked at him and I says, what in the hell is Shake and Bake School? <laughs> he says, well, it's more another three or four months of intensive training. And if you pass, you'd be going to Vietnam as a Sergeant E-5. You'll be a leader over there or a squad leader or whatever. And I asked him what this consists of, and it consists of a lot of intensive PT, a lot of, a lot of different things that are, was pretty intensive. And I said, well, I'll try it. And had a lot of stamina back then, probably more than now, but I Kept going and kept going. I was the skinniest guy and the last one to graduate from it. So I got my E5 stripes from Fort Knox. Then I proceeded to a more, you gotta keep in mind, I was training for reconnaissance. And that means to find wherever the enemy's hiding, okay? So I was then transferred to Fort Hood and uh, what are we going to do there? I mean, they keep you kind of out of things. I mean, so I got down there and we did another four, five, four months of bivouac training in the desert with all the armadillos. We played war games. We'd set up jeeps and a whole command system of this side, and I was on this side, and we practiced war games, firing blanks at each other, and a lot of that maneuvered there. 
as far as what. And from there, I finally got my orders for Vietnam. I come home for a month before I went back to Vietnam. But we all knew what we were slated for. So I went to Vietnam as a reconnaissance person. Talk a little bit about the, the flight over. You got to stop someplace where your dad was. Yeah, that's an experience. That's one I won't forget. I, I'm one of the few around here that ever landed on Wake Island, and that is really an experience. It's a big rock out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, nowhere. And there's hundreds, there's hundreds of feet of cliffs on all sides of it. And when we, I left Tacoma in Washington, D.C., we had to make stops at Wake Island, probably Tokyo, before we got to Tansanut, Vietnam. And we landed at Wake Island, and let me tell you, we had a, we were looking down at that rock, we had a whole bunch, of, and that was a DC stretch eight with 300 people in it, or comrades in it. And that, that was a little scary. That was scary, landing that huge plane on that rock. It's like landing that plane on this carpet right here, no bigger. Is that where and you had Thanksgiving dinner? No. No? No. No, that was in Vietnam. That was in Vietnam, yeah. okay. But uh, we proceeded from there to <coughs> Tokyo. No, we landed in the Philippines first, then Wake Island, then Tokyo, mm. then Tansanu, Vietnam. And uh, from there? We went from there to Benoit. It was a big base not too far from Saigon. And they processed us, us through both places, Tom Street and Benoit. And then I can't remember, I think I was bussed out to Phuc Ven. They placed me in the first air cab, first of the ninth, is the midsection of Vietnam. I was about 60 miles from Song Bay near the Cambodian border. So here, here's what happened. We operated <coughs> in, in two bases I operated at. But they had me in the first air calf, first of the ninth. And when I got over there, they put me down in the tin hooches you may see on some of these pictures. And I was there by myself. And, Talked to a few guys there, a few comrades, men. Uh, that was a helicopter base that I'm telling you. And I'm trying to tell you it's a, it's a large helicopter base, one of the largest in Vietnam. And I'm saying to the guy next to me, what the hell am I doing here? He said, well, you're recon, aren't you, 11D40? I said, yeah. Well, he says, welcome. You're going to be in a helicopter. Wait a minute. What are you saying to me? Well, my 11D-40 is recon. In Vietnam, we had very few tanks and APCs that I was trained in. Everything that was done mostly by helicopter. Most of the bombardment and everything was done by helicopter. And the 105s at, at, at some of the bases. We had 105 artillery and 155. But tanks and APCs were not in, at least in my area, in the midsection of Vietnam. So the following day or two, they come back and they said to me, uh, <coughs> you got to do some uh, more uh, training. I didn't know anything. I just went along for the ride. I said, all right. They lined a bunch of us new recruits up and marched us down. One of my famous stories is, and I still have nightmares over it, I went down for about half mile or so, and there's this huge tower. And I said, what's this? He says, see that tower? It's about 80 feet in the air, and there's a big flat platform on top of it. And you're going to jump off it backwards on a rope. Hold it. <laughs> that, wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. I'm courageous, but wait a minute. And... He says, that's called repelling. 
if you ever have to repel out of a helicopter, and don't ask me how I did it, but I did it. I went all the way down with the rope and everything. And the sergeant was on the ground down there, and he says, if you kneel down with your knees touch the ground, you're going to be doing 20 push-ups. You can't let your knees hit the ground when you end the ground. You can back right off the rope and the whole works. So that was an experience. Uh, after that, I was assigned to a troop in Loach helicopter. They put me in a Loach helicopter, and it's an L-60. It's a small reconnaissance helicopter. And when I first got there, since I was new, they sent me out on downed birds. A lot of them helicopters get blown right out of the air. And we went out to rescue the, if there was any survivors in the helicopter, along with the grunt units and the, and the, and the uh, Bravo helicopters, the Hueys. But we had to down, we had to go out for downed birds, a lot of it. And the men never made it. So we did a lot of missions of that sort of first. And I was really getting experienced. I didn't never realize this would happen. No one back in the States, hardly any of that applied. But after a while, they said, well, you're going to go out for the real thing now and do some missions out in the AO, Area of Operation, and Tainan, Song Bay, Quinn La. Uh, we, had, we had our own, let's put it this way, five or six counties, as you would say here, our own area of operation. We had to go out and check for uh, movement or whatever. So this consisted of a low helicopter but a bunch, of, a bunch of warrant pilots that weren't too congenial and they couldn't even talk to them or even, they thought they were something else. They weren't very nice people. They, I just took orders from them and that's it. I was, not, I was in the co-pilot seat of the cyclic and collective. They had the mainstay. We had, a, we had a gunner in the back with grenades and smoke grenades and I had my M60 or M M16 with me. And we were treetop level. We just did treetop level scouting over there. Wherever they thought Nighthawk would pick up some movement or anywhere else they could get sounds of movement in some way or the other. And Nighthawk was a Piper Cub that roamed around in the middle of the night out there with infrared radar on it. And they'd pick up movement. So we proceeded with a lot of missions during the day to go out and what we call recon these areas, DVA the areas, but we weren't alone. What we had, anytime we went out, we had the Cobra with us, an attack helicopter. And we were only treetop level. It's lucky we weren't. Many a times we landed, the, we landed the helicopter with blades there, with rounds right through the blades. We're used to that. But the Cobra was up about four or five hundred feet above us, and we were about 150 feet, not even. And if we seen or any movement or whatever, encountered anything, what we would do, we wouldn't engage unless we were engaged on. We would drop smoke grenades and show the area that, where we thought the enemy was, and we'd move out of the area smartly with the loach, and the Cobra would come down with all their rocket pods and just pulver pulverize the area for the kills. But it was a team of uh, Loach Helicopter and Cobra. Uh, we did this many a times. That was once every day, once every two days, whatever. And uh, try to talk to them young hot dogs lieutenants. You couldn't talk to them. They were very strict. If I said anything, you, I, I just took orders from them and sat there silent. That's all you could do. And did, we did a lot of missions. We also did missions out of Song Bay, right near the Cambodian border. We flew out of there many times. So there's a wide variety of things. 
And one of the highlights of doing that is I had the experience working with the B-52 bombers. Because a lot of times we'd be down in an AO looking at the area with the Cobra above, and all of a sudden the Cobra would come down and say to us, we have to move out, get up two, 3,000 feet along with the Cobra, and move over to this area over here. And we went over there, and my pilot said, just keep watching the air up there. It was just saturated with like, like pepper. It was all 500 pound bombs coming down. They were, de they were uh, arc lighting a whole area with a B-52. We couldn't see the B-52, but we seen all the bombs dropping in. That's really something. Disney World has nothing like it, believe me. <laughs> so after that, we had to go down and what I call recon the area again, the whole area where the B-52, and all it was was a series of craters and we never found no dead or anything because if they were hit, they were buried. Uh, it's really something. It, it, uh, really something to see, and it can go on for a long, long while. And it's a, a tremendous area a B-52 can do. But I was in the midst of all of that in, in the air cave, and uh, I got myself in a few problems over there, being in the air cave. And you want me to go on or? Uh, I don't even think I need to be here. You can just talk. <laughs> July, it. July 1969. Uh, we landed at, I can't remember the LZ we landed at. We had to refuel or something. And uh, we landed a little loach. And next thing I knew, now the little loach is all, it's a, all bubble glass in front. And we landed it, and next thing I knew, all I seen was white. The pilot was saying, jump out, bail out. We were on the ground. I guess someone seen us land and threw some murders at us. So, hopped out of the helicopter, dove down the bunker. Luckily, there was a bunker right close by. And we dove down there, and I sat there for about five or ten minutes, and someone from the base come in and say, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm okay. What happened? Well, you got income coming in, and you got hit. So I said, check yourself over. Well, at the time, I thought everything, everything was good. Felt a little something in my right foot, and a piece of shrapnel went through here and out the other exit. Entrance and exit wound. Let me interrupt you for a second. Mm. You gave me a whole bunch of photos. Yeah. The one there. directly behind you, I believe that is your injury? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, left foot. Left foot. Left foot. I'm wrong. It's been a while. And these are just crashes. We wanted to show folks what a loach looked like in, in helicopter crashes. Yeah. So. so they met have me back to food van, fixed up my... Uh, Foot took some shrapnel out of this side of my head, and absolutely. Funny part of it is, about a year ago, they they found some more shrapnel in me in the MRI in the VA hospital. It's still there. My souvenirs here. So that's when I got my first Purple Heart, what he's referring to. The second Purple Heart, I've had some troubles with. Uh, you want me to go on, or it's up to you? We, uh, and yeah, this is a hard one. I got to know the area quite well when we were doing our missions out with five or seven. seven I mean, you never go out with the same pilot. You always go out with a different pilot most of the time. And I knew most of the areas out there, because you don't miss too much. You know? Well, one day we were out there, and I knew, I knew something was wrong. I was with a hot dog pilot. And I said, I said, where are we? What are we doing? He says, never mind, just do your job. Okay. So I, I knew we were way out of base, way out of sync from where we usually do our area of operations. And next thing I knew, he banked that helicopter to the left, 
and I was a receiver. And we got shot down. We crashed the helicopter. And I don't know how it never exploded when it hit the ground. I remember bailing out of it. We, it it's just like a big, the jungle stick. And it come down, he auto rotated it down somehow. And it come down in a big, like a big shrubbery, like a big massive, it wasn't trees, but it, it cushioned the blow and the three of us dived out of it. And when we dived out of it, we were taking fire. And like I say, I knew we were in a hot spot. It, this wasn't the normal mission. And we got out and we, we started firing back. But we, we couldn't see nothing, you just fire back. You can't see no light. The jungle's so thick just to say we're there armed. But uh, we spent about 20 minutes on the ground and the cobra saved our, our butts. The cobra come in, he was still up there, and what he did, he had 64 rockets on the cobra, 32 on each side. What he did was surround us with rocket fire all the way around us, all four sides. He kept firing rockets so that we couldn't be taken prisoner. And that was quite an experience. So that lasted about a half hour, and last I knew, I, I turned around, there was two Huey helicopters landing. I don't know where they come from. I don't know whether they were out that area or how they got there, but we were come in and rescue. We come back all the way in a Huey, the three of us did. And uh, they come in behind us somehow. I don't know how they ever got there to this day or where they were to get there so quick because it was a different area we were in. But they rescued us, brought, brought us back to Fu Glen. And they went all through me. And I knew I had a little problem with my wrist here. And I sat there in their makeshift hospital back then. And uh, they, the AK-47 got me. They grazed my wrist right here. And they were bandaging my wrist up. And, uh, you're lucky. Next thing I know, this is, this is a great. Next thing I knew, some nurse or doctor come in. It wasn't a nurse. Or I don't know who it was. One of the one of the men from that base come in. Said, Sergeant, you you got a flight vest on? I says, well, certainly we got to have a flight vest on. Now the flight vest is army wrapped cloth and a big thick piece of steel, and you can hardly get up on it. It's very heavy, but you have to put flight vest on the helicopters. He says, uh, we got your flight vest. I said, that's good. What are you going to, what do I, what are you getting at? What do I care? You got my flight vest. Could have left it with the helicopter. He said, no, we want to show you something. I said, all right. Okay, what's up? He says, is this your name on it? I said, yeah. He said, you better take a look at this. I had one here and one here. The flight vest is that thick. I only had another eighth inch to go. I got, when he banked that helicopter, he banked it right into the fire. I got one in the wrist. No one else got anything but me. I took it all on the, let's say, the left side of the helicopter. So I had one, two, plus three. If the flight vest, flight vest was not on, I wouldn't be here. But uh, and come to find out, I've always wondered about that location and about what happened. They knew something was not right. And what well, was about six, seven months ago, in my own house, I learned on the History Channel that I was shot down in Cambodia because I knew we were over the line on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which I never knew. So I brought this to Don Smith in the back there. And we talked about it, and he says, you ought to go talk to somebody at the VA hospital about this or whatever. So we did. But um, after that, I quit flying. I just, I just told him I'm done. I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. I was lucky I wasn't court-martialed. They let me quit. 
And they said, well, you can't go home. You're not hurt that bad. You're going to stay with us. All right. He says, we are going to now put you in our only rat patrol unit we have here on this base. And I said, well, what's that consist of? He says, you're going to be in charge of a squad with five or six gun jeeps. And from here on out, Lieutenant Benton, my other master sergeant, I forget his name, we operated out of Fook Ven. And we also made a lot of missions state and Song Bay, which is near the Cambodian border, right on it. So what we did with the, with the gun jeeps, we went out for night ambush, many a nights. We'd set up a perimeter on night ambush where the Piper Cub with their infrared radar figured they had movement. We'd go out there and just set up in the middle of the jungle, night ambush, and see what was going on. And we did that around Phuc Van. We did it around Song Bay, another 60, 70 miles from Phuc Van, our second base. And we uh, also in the daytime, they would send us out on missions. We'd leave one guy back with a jeep and we'd hump two or three, three clicks, which is 1,000 meters a click. And we'd go scouting in the daytime, too, on this gun jeep deal. <coughs> and trying to find movement. Found some, reported it. 105 would take care of some of it. Other than that, the Cobras would come in, or the unit I used to be in, fire on it. But we had an active time. We did get to stay back at the rear a night or two nights in a row, but then the other seven nights we were given missions. So. It was active, uh, I call it fun. And uh, quite active over there. How long the were you in the Jeep Reconnaissance? Nine months. Nine months and three months in the helicopter? Yeah. Um, I had quite a team. It most likely you may see them on these photos of mine or whatever. When you yeah. did Jeep Reconnaissance, so you are the, we, you're the boss? I was the boss, yes. How do you keep morale up while you're there? How do you keep morale up? Yeah. How do you when you guys come? You really want to ask me that? You got to keep the men happy. You don't hardball them. I'll tell you that. You got a problem. I'm embarrassed to say how I kept them happy. But I kept them happy, all right. Because every every other night there'd be a lot of a lot of uh, anxious women at the gate, and they want to come out with us all night long. How's that one? And I let them, I let them do it. It's lucky I'm not court-martialed. I did a lot of no-no's. No, I didn't engage, but I had to keep the men happy. I woke up a lot of nights, they were all smoking pot on me. But they were a great bunch of guys, and I could count on them. And I would do anything protect them. I lied a lot on, on some of the arrows we went to. I said, there's no movement out of here. There's water buffalo in here. <laughs> no. I, I wouldn't do anything unless we really, my back was against the wall as far as firing or getting into it. No way. No, it, it's just not worth it. No. Okay. No, we had a good team. We had a good team. When your time and one, one of my right hand men, I can't remember his name. I had an Indian with us. I had a Kit Garson scout with us on that. He's an NVA converted to South Vietnamese, and he knows where all the tricks are. So we had him with us. His, if we didn't know anything, he would point out things to us. He was an NVA converted to South Vietnamese, and one of my right hand men was an Afro American guy. I forget his name. I have my driver, my gunner. The Jeeps, the Jeeps were armed with an M60 machine gun. We didn't have no recordless rifles or any of that stuff they had in World All we had was a 60, 60 machine gun, both of our Jeeps, small arms fire M16s. 
bunch of hand grenades. And yes, I carried a lot of C4, <laughs> which is really something, which we never had to use, thank God. The only time we use C4 is when we cut a chunk off to heat our C rations up. <laughs> you just don't want to put electrical discharge fuel with it, fuse with it or you're gone for good. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you get notice that was you were coming home? Oh, a month. A month before we come home in June. You know, they give me a month month notice. Did they? Yeah. Yeah. Were, were you counting down the days? Yeah. How'd you get home? Did you fly? Did you? That's another experience. They uh, flew me into Tansanut. Tansanut was the main air base over there with all the planes. The commercial planes brought us to Vietnam, mostly all commercial. And then we flew out of there and see 130s or 131s for the rest of Vietnam in the, in the area. But that, they I kind of came home. There's another one of them big DC stretch eights. I don't even know if they're in service anymore. Uh, we took off from, I'm not sure if it was from Benoit or Tansanut. It wasn't Saigon. I've only been on Saigon once. That's a no-no. Uh, we took off, and being in helicopters and up in the air, I, I knew the height pretty good, no matter what height we were at. Oh, I had a rough time getting, getting out of there. This pilot takes off from this DC Stretch 8, it's probably about 30, 40 miles from there to the ocean. And he never gained, gained any height. He was only up about 1,000 feet. The rest of these comrades didn't realize anything. I did, because I know you could get shot down easy with 1,000 feet. I was out in the back of the airplane screaming, get the damn thing in the air, let's go, get it high. He didn't. He never lifted that plane until he got to the ocean. It's lucky. But uh, that, that was scary, because that was really low level coming out of there with that big plane that low with that many people on it. And the civilian pilots, I don't think they realized, you know, they had no realize, realization of what could happen. Because they had, they had RPGs and they had, they had stuff they could go in the air back then. Not like, well, they, M72 laws could do that. Now they have the M88s. And they have all new stuff now that I don't even know about. But uh, yeah, we flew out and they flew me into uh, what's that? Oakland, Oakland. I landed right across from San Francisco. There had to get my own plane ticket home. So I arrived here, but. Uh, I look at Vietnam as my year's vacation, all expenses paid, and I got to play with the big boy toys. Talk about, you and I talked about this, what it was like even when you were on a, a rest near the front of the line, it wasn't rest. The constant oh, no, state no, of no, no, no. When we're stationed in Phuc Banner in Song Bay, I'm going to tell you, I have the record of being incomed. We, you can, when you think it's raining out and you're in a tin hooch, it's not raining, it's shrapnel. They'd walk the 106s in at night, mortar rounds, 81 mortar, starting about 10 o'clock when we're all in bed, when we're back in the air. In Song Bay, we got hammered a lot there. I can't believe. They'd, they'd mortar us and rock us every night or every other night. Sure, you go to the PX, they cook all our food, uh, they were all in there and they, they know the whole area. They go home, they change like Dr. Jekyll and Hyde. And what I can tell you is when you're over there, them people are all the same. They don't have no suits on. I'm North Vietnamese, I'm South Vietnamese, I'm Cambodian. Them people are basically all Chinese people. You can't differentiate between them. And you never know. It's not like World War II, no way near. 
You just don't know where you're fooling with. And you're encountering. And they were good with mortars. They're one of the best. They could place a mortar anywhere. But uh, yeah, many nights we got mortar trapped. And we ran, ran, we run out of these tin hoochers you may see, and we had bunkers we ran into. A uh, few of them didn't make it a few nights. Uh, Song Bay, we didn't have that many bunkers at Song Bay. We were right out in the open up there. And a lot of times, I'll let you know this, I did have a few heart attacks. Not really. This happened up, yeah, Song Bay. They, they put us out and they, we used to have to, what I call recon, reconnaissance. They, we went through a lot of rubber tree plantations. And almost shot myself once. I was, I was the skinniest guy and they had me point. And I looked down, I had a rubber tree spider on me. Now a rubber tree spider is nothing like you encounter here. A rubber tree spider is that big a body with legs like this. It was right here. And I went berserk. It happened two or three times. So the moral of the story is this. One day we were at Song Bay and we had a mission to go up on top of Nui Barra, the highest mountain, they had an LZ up there, so they loaded us in two Chinook helicopters and brought us up there to walk down the other side of the mountain to see what was there. We got halfway down the, the mountain. We were, we were brought up in two Chinook helicopters at the LZ, and we had to walk down the mountain DBA to see if there's any movement. And this was pretty intensive jungle. And uh, went down and Sarge, we stopped for a break. And one of the guys come up, Sarge, you got to take a look in the tree. Oh. We had a rubber tree spider. The body was that big and the legs would come up. It was huge. One of the biggest spiders in probably the world. I took my rifle and went right down the mountain and beat everybody. <laughs> but, uh, no, uh, we had scorpion spiders over there. I had the medevac a man out one night when he got bit <laughs> two o'clock in the middle of the night. Scorpion spider got underneath him. And that was scary, landing a helicopter in the middle of the night over there at two o'clock to get him out of there. It was, we were in an LZ just taking over an LZ about four or five miles from Fook Van. They wanted us out there in the LZ instead of just out in the boonies on a regular night ambush. We had to land the helicopter and get him out of there, which was very, very scary. And uh, some snakes, spiders, but never encountered an alligator in that jungle, believe it or not. It just wasn't that marshy for alligators where I was. It was in the central part. But water buffalo and had to watch where you're running the jeep. We ran over a Chicom once. It didn't go off. We pulled out probably 100 yards from the Chicom. Blew it with an M79 grenade. Blew it up. Ran right over it. Never went off. Thank God. One experience. Now oh, there's lots of experiences. One of the scariest experiences I had one day when they took us in two Chinook helicopters and we were going to go in, into Cambodia and relieve some prisoners. And let me tell you, I had a scared crew in that, in that helicopter. They were in tears. We were all scared. We had no idea we were going to go in and relieve some prisoners in Cambodia. We got in Cambodia a little bit, and I don't know why, but the mission was called off, and we turned around and come back. I don't know to this day why it was called off, but got lucky there. So, I mean, there's a lot of experiences, but... We'll talk about coming home and working with the War Veterans Memorial. We'll finish with that. Well, to be honest with you, a knock come to my house in 1980, and I was good friends with the 
a Paul Motor in school. We used to mess around and go ice skating and everything else back then. Uh, there's no pot and other stuff they have today. And uh, I knocked come to my door and it was his father, Ken Muggle. He lives up here on the terrace, he's a salesman. And he says, well, you're always with my son, I hear you're a veteran. Yeah. He said, how would you like, we're, we're forming the new VFW here in Canastota. 1980, Carl Malick, Joe Corinci, Louis Belducci, and uh, Ken Muggle. Leon James from the beach down here on the Shell Shore. How would you like to join? What do I have to do? What? What? He said, well, well, we'll bring you right in. You ever have shorthand? I said, no, what do you mean shorthand? Someone to bring you right in. You join us, you'll be right up front with me. Okay, doing what? Well, you're going to take the minutes. <laughs> it's called adjunct. In VFW language, which is a thankless job and a long, long job. So they brought me right in. I was adjutant for five or six years. I took over quartermaster. And I was in a new post here, hot and heavy. And we had uh, Joyce Ezo, uh, Louise Ezo. We had a whole bunch of Canastodians in there. So we formed a new post, and probably as you know, we went to Chapel Street, now we have the post down here. Well, meanwhile, back at the ranch, I think it was 83, 84, somewhere in there. Uh, I won't mention the man's name in Anita. He wanted to expand and put a Vietnam Monument somewhere here in Madison County, strictly Vietnam. And Ed Cook, Joe Corinci, Louis, Myers. Yeah. Those are all World War II guys, right? Most of them. They were upset with that. And they wanted to expand it to all four wars, just not Vietnam. And uh, they invited me to join the committee, in the committee of 12. I said, I don't know what I'm getting into again, but to represent, I'll do it. So I joined. So for years, I. Ed Cook, Don Serio, Joe Corinci. I was on the committee with Louie for fundraising. We got our first $15,000 from Nancy Lorraine Hoffman to start the monument. So we were in the monument business, and I don't think John Becker was the no. lead down there at that time. But we got a piece of property, which you now know it's in front of the uh, courthouse. They give us that piece of property to put a monument on. And uh, Bob West was a professional builder and engineer. And he designed us a monument of all four wars. And so in a lot of meetings and hubbub, and it took place. We went over this other gentleman's head and got the schematics and started in on a Four Wars Monument, Madison County War Veterans Monument, and they made wave them. And we commenced to build the Wave Monument in 84. We did a lot of fundraising and this and that, but we wanted all four wars. And I was always for that, because I thought of my father and all the other people in World War II back in that era, like I said earlier. And I, Vietnam was nice. But you have World War I, II, Korea, Vietnam. So here we go. I'm in. And 
we spent a lot of time planning and building and trying to get things on a roll with the flag poles and the whole works. And we, we've done some changes in front of the monument now. And uh, recently, we had two comrades, Bolins and Kessler, I can't remember Latcher. the other name. Latcher. Latcher, yeah. We had two comrades got killed in Iraq. And the way the monument was supposed to be on the books was only for four wars at the time. Well, we have a new committee now. Uh, I think I and Rick Warham are the only ones left of the originals. We have a very good, well-trained committee. And, and most of them said, we have two men that died. So in the meantime, we took two plaques, now where the Marine Corps flag is, in the back and put their names on it to honor them at that memorial. Because at the time, there was no easy way to construction we could redo that monument in the position it was in the four stones that are there. So we come up with a last year, year and a half, we come up with a idea because we wanted to exploit them names and we thought if there's any other future wars we would like to put a fifth monument in there that we can counter the names and the future names if there's any other wars in the future. So we had a task and uh, John Regan and of course, John Becker was all for it. And thanks to John, he's the boss really down there. And John Regan's head of maintenance. And uh, we got a hold of them. And we put two and two together with some meetings and figured if we could get a fifth monument in there to put the two names on for now in the future too. So we got a hold of Willis Bexton. And a bunch of us had a meeting and everything, and we decided John Regan thought we could do something in the center of the monument. So we put a pyramided monument in there with four or five sides on each one. <coughs> we did install it. Lois Pexton, Pexton Monument, did a great job designing it. And we, the, the footer held there wasn't that much in the center, and they dug it in, and now it's we got a, a reconstructed <coughs> five five war monument down there, and uh, it, it turned out to be real nice, and thanks to a whole lot of people, and uh, we got the two names on it, with, uh, more room for many more. That's just recent, last year, and. Uh, they reconstructed a lot of the shrubbery around the monument. Uh, Lowe's did that for us. So we, we got her on a roll down there. But uh, I'm very, very pleased the way it is right now. And uh, you want to take some questions? Yeah. Yeah. Has anybody got any questions for Doug? Yeah. Fire away. Yes. When did you start with the Purple Heart Museum? That was what, that was my wife's deal. She got me in there two years ago. Yeah. Yeah, about two years ago. We went to visit that. That was, that was really something. It is. We, we, were, we, were, we left out of Utica on a bus. And that was an experience. <laughs> We had a Anybody state. Hear the question. The question was about the Purple Heart Museum. It's down on the Hudson. Right. And they had a little advertisement in the paper about uh, visiting West Point along with this museum. And right. I've never been to West Point before, so that's, I said, "Oh, goody! I'll find out the details." And so that's, that's an experience. And, uh, because yeah. I'm. We took off out of Utica. We had a police escort, state trooper escort, all the way down. Then we got the, right, 
we got to West Point and a whole motorcade of motorcycles took over and got us into West Point. Then they directed us, it's only a few miles there from West Point to the Purple Heart Museum. It's a very small museum. But it's Not growing. Well. It's growing. They're actively searching yeah. for more stories. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, it's a nice place. It's beautiful down there in West Point. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they give us a dinner and a whole works. And Any other and questions? Yes, we did have some rats in there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No alligators, but we had rats, mice, spiders, and you name it. And, uh, so you did enjoy an R&R &R in Hawaii? Yes, we did go to R&R &R in Hawaii for an R&R, &R, a little rest. That was, that was something. It's the only time I'll ever see that. But uh, if you want to... He has one of the neatest photos of a porpoise you will ever see from Hawaii. Yeah, I got in midair. Yeah, it, it's in his photo album over there. Back then, we didn't have a Fancy sophisticated thing. cameras back then that uh, we have now. Other questions? But, uh, when did you marry Evelyn? <laughs> see, I forget. Back in when? Seven, 72. 72, right. 70, good job. Good memory. Yeah. Joe? So the last thing, come on, Joe. The last thing we're going to talk a little bit about, Joe's going to take over for us. Uh, you received a number of medals. And Joe's going to give you a little speech for a moment, if you don't mind. Yeah, this yeah. is Joe Hubbard. Correct me if I'm wrong. The head of the uh, VFW, commander, commander of the Canastota yeah. VFW. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Joe Hubbard, and I am the current commander of VFW Post 600 here in Canastota. I've been given the honor of presenting something to Doug Ginning from his family. Now Doug, you might be thinking that your brother from the VFW got you this token. He did not. Maybe your wife. No, Doug. No. How about Natalie? Are you curious, Doug? Could yeah, I am. Maybe wave him? Hard to know when you belong to so many organizations and do so much for your community. You know, Doug, I bet the mayor of Canastota probably gives you balloons for your birthday. <laughs> How'd you know? <laughs> Carla, come over to the house with four or five balloons. What the hell is this? <laughs> Some say it's hard to judge the military of today to those that were drafted against their will years ago. Yeah, everyone can agree that any military service changes you. It teaches you integrity and honor and other positive traits. Yet not all live by what they are taught. Still, there's another group of veterans that unfortunately have gone to combat. It don't matter if you were drafted or volunteered, everyone who served their country in combat and who was able to come home alive comes home a different person. I came home from both my combat tours through cheering crowds and clapping, and yet I still struggle with myself in society. Today, some 22 veterans a day give up and take their own lives because they can't cope. Yet, Doug, you came home to people calling you baby killer and other names. One might wonder how you and other veterans that came home back then dealt with it. I sometimes wonder how high that number might have been back then. Hey, I, we weren't walking with the Legion that much at all, Vietnam veterans. I know that you, Doug, watch the news every day and try to keep up with everything that is going on around the world and especially in our own country. I know how hard that can be. Like many combat veterans, I don't. I find it hard to understand how politicians can pass certain laws and take certain views on a lot of hot topics. Some that one could say is against the freedom that we so freely enjoy. When asked about serving your country before, you stated that it awakened you on everyday situations and that you were proud to serve and also enjoying the freedom that we have. Unfortunately, people never seem to learn from the past and history always seems to repeat itself. Ronald Reagan, our 40th President of the United States stated, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. 
we didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Now, I may have gotten a little off track, but I never missed a chance of letting others know about the 22 veterans a day or about our freedom. I met Doug when I joined the VFW some five years ago. It seems like so much longer to me, because anyone who knows Doug knows how full of life he is. Now, Doug was the unofficial handyman around our post. That is to say, he was one who would always fix what needed to be fixed, even if he did not know how to fix it. He <laughs> still was, or he would attempt to. Duct tape. Duct tape. <laughs> Short story. When we moved our cannon, an electric was needing some adjustment. Doug, Lanny, and I were working on it. Doug took charge and sounded like my father when he told me to just do it his way. <laughs> Even though it did not make sense to me, I figured that he knew what he was doing. Wrong. <laughs> Let's just say it was an enlightening experience for me. Yeah, it exploded. I asked Doug afterwards if he knew anything about electrical work. And he told me not much. <laughs> I laughed at him. And then he said that if he did not do it, who would? That last sentence says it all. If he did not do it, who would? That sentence is why Doug is so openly known by everyone around the area. It's why he is loved by most everybody, even Lenny. I bet Hillary. Oh, do don't it. mention that. <laughs> <laughs> he won't sleep tonight, uh, Hillary. I love you, Doug. And I'm not ashamed to say it. You have been a positive role model to me. I enjoy not only the projects that we have done together, but also our talks, especially when there's one to one. But even a little McDonald's time I cherish. <laughs> Doug, you must know that you've been blessed with a wonderful life. And those of us who have gathered here today want to say thanks to you for being who and what you are. Doug, I can assure you that you have touched so many people in your life that the world is a better place today because of you. So Doug, mm -hmm. have you figured out the answer to my question I proposed to you? I ask you, do you know who got you this? I can't tell you a person's name because it was not a person. I can't tell you an organization's name because it was not an organization. And no doubt, as much as you might wish it, it is not from the Clinton Foundation. <laughs> Are you still I confused? Hope not. <laughs> yes, well done. I am. You should have ran for mayor because everyone is behind you. I believe that everyone here would agree that we are in the presence of greatness, so great that the entire community has come together to present you with this. Let me say that again so it can sink in. This gift is from the entire community that you have supported all your life. Whenever I see those flags flying in front of all those businesses in the years to come, I will smile and think of you. And Doug, do not worry. I will take your watch and make sure that Guinea's gun will always sound with Brooks's boom <laughs> being operated by that dummy Master Sergeant Hubbard <laughs> in the place that you devoted your life to build. And almost without further delay, Just make sure I want to present you with a token. But first, I would like to invite your wife Evelyn up here because people always forget about the family. And the family goes through just as much as a veteran does, only on a different scale. So the community has come together to present Evelyn with the flowers here. Well, how about that? Wow. <laughs> Congratulations. Wow. How about that, Leah? Everybody hey. get a good view of it? Want to take a oh, wow. Thank you very much, Doug. Thank you.
This is beautiful. How about that? Somebody did some nice homework. Thank you. Thank you very much. I can't believe it. How about that? Got the old clean cluster on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Pete. Boy. Nice. Didn't know there were so many hot dogs. I didn't realize that many. Well, I will say one thing that was kind of overlooked. Um, This medal here means more to me than anything. I do receive the two Purple Hearts and I got the Brown Star and some nice medals. But this medal here is my medal. The United States Army, I got awarded that my second Purple Heart when I was shot down. And that's the Army Archon with, with Valor. And to me, that's the highest medal I have, more than the Purple Heart. And that, that was really something to get that medal with Valor. That's one of my best. But. Uh, I thank you for everything, and uh, I'm glad every everyone attended. I couldn't believe we have such a big crowd. I will stand here and say I'm very proud of the VFW here in Canastota. I think they've done a great job. A lot of members, a lot of members are passed, and I I, I got to say I couldn't be any prouder to represent. Madison County War veterans as president of Madison County War that died for our country. They're number one. They're the heroes. I, I never thought I'd be in such a position to be in that committee. And we have some great people. I'm going to say that. I'm not going to say best of the best because there's some out there that are better than me, a lot of us. But I'm going to say we have some great people and very experienced people in the waiting committee, which I'm very, very happy over. And uh, I'm honored to be with them in that committee, that's for sure. And I'm honored to also be in the VFW. I'm honored to hear you're here tonight. I'm honored my wife put up with me. I don't know why, but. Um, <laughs> but uh, I thank Matt for all his endeavor here. I thank you. Yeah. I think everybody today says thank you. Well, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. This is it. <laughs> All right. Thanks, folks. I think that's it, folks. Thank you all very much for coming. All right. Thanks for coming. Really.